I'm very pleased to welcome you on this uh, second webinar. And those who are were on the first webinar, uh, they have uh, heard about all the standardization work and on the um, uh, regulation work that uh, takes place concerning the GATS. Uh, today, we uh, take it a step further, or today, this afternoon, we'll take it a step further, and we are going to look at uh, GATS solutions. So um, what is industry doing in uh, making GATS a reality? How to implement the GATS? So uh, also uh, today and this afternoon, we have a very interesting lineup of speakers and uh, presentations. And I would like to ask everyone of the panel to uh, switch on their camera so that uh, you can see uh, the, the speakers. Um, so I will also briefly introduce them. Um, Emmanuel Sixik Paré um, is a strategic product manager at Orolia. Good afternoon, Emmanuel. Um, so the one who's smiling, he, that's Emmanuel. Hello, Anke. Uh, hi. You. He joined Orolia in uh, 1999 as a business unit manager. Um, has been working with the aviation department to develop the new Canuck Ultima lines, especially designed to meet the latest requirements for the commercial aviation industry and regulation. Uh, from South Africa, Paul Rue. Hi, Paul. Good to see you. Nice background also. Um, Paul is um, a CEO, managing director of a number of companies. Uh, lots of um, experience with the communication between aircraft <coughs> and ground, sorry. And Paul was invited to contribute to a number of working groups related uh, to the GATS, the Autonomous Distress Tracking Working Group, and the Timely Recovery of Flight Data Working Group. And he's also contributing uh, to the uh, ladder uh, uh, developments, location of aircraft in distress repository. And he's passionate about uh, promoting safety and innovation in the aviation sector, as he is of the African wildlife and bush. Um, then uh, Mercedes Resch, hi Mercedes. Uh, Pildo Labs manager joined in uh, 2004 uh, as aerospace uh, managers, giving technical support uh, to various uh, projects, uh, mainly on the area of GNSS um, and uh, involved in the international projects. Nowadays, he's in charge of the engineering business unit, and that includes uh, SAR activities. Um, Ian Knowles from ICAO. Montreal, hi Ian, oh. uh, is technical officer in the international safety section of the International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO. His responsibilities are related to flight operation, including supporting the flight ops panel and maintaining Annex 6. Um, prior to ICAO, he, in 2014, he was captain on the Airbus A320 for British Airways. Um, not uh, yet shown is Claude Pichavan. He works for Airbus, uh, but when he uh, joins, when he's going to present, I will introduce him as well. So a very um, a good panel, uh, very interesting presentations we are looking forward to. And I, um, I propose that we uh, immediately start and we, we do that with uh, Emmanuel. And the subject will be ELT DT solutions. Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Hank, for giving us the, the opportunity to present the, the perspective uh, from uh, an ELT uh, supplier and to, to provide uh, yes, some visibility on the practical implementation of, uh, of uh, ELT. So, uh, sorry, as a... As a quick introduction about uh, Aurelia. So Aurelia is an um, expert of resilient positioning, navigation, and timing uh, uh, solutions. We are very much present in uh, accurate and secured timing distribution for, uh, for critical infrastructures. And we are also very much present in the distress beacons for, for aviation world, whether it's for general aviation or for um, commercial aviation. So for the last 25 years, uh, we have fielded around 80,000 uh, ELTs, introducing uh, uh, many times a lot of innovation in our products, 
uh, like uh, in 2010 with uh, Integra, which was the, the first TLT to, to include uh, a GNSS receiver as well as a backup for six megahertz uh, antenna. So we keep on uh, innovating on a new generation of, uh, of uh, ELTs, uh, which have been uh, developed uh, also with the help of the, the GSA uh, with, through uh, European Commission programs. Uh, in particular, the Ultima S, which is a, a new generation survival uh, ELT that provides uh, uh, Galileo RLS acknowledgement uh, capability. So this one will be introduced in 2021 next year. Okay, so we are showing uh, here uh, the, the, the new generation uh, Ultima DT. Uh, this will be really the object of my presentation. So it's the new generation of distress tracking ELTs which will be made available uh, in 2022. So just to describe a bit how this uh, ELTDT design uh, has been uh, um, a complex uh, route. I, I'd like to emphasize uh, a the, the fact that requirements uh, have been uh, uh, defined uh, uh, in, uh, on the, on the performance-based uh, approach uh, by IKO and IASA. This has led uh, Aurelia uh, to uh, build uh, a design which has taken into account uh, the, the progress of uh, specifications. So now these specifications are quite uh, stabilized. On the IKO side, uh, um, as described this morning, uh, uh, we have the CONOPS V6 in particular, the guidance document 10.054, the LADAR specification. On the IASA side, uh, there is the very much um, uh, general uh, requirement from uh, European Union uh, CAT Gen MPA 210 for location of aircraft in distress. And uh, more recently, uh, we had the, the NPA 2020 minus 03, uh, which brings uh, a lot of details and um, uh, requirements actually on, the, on, on these uh, initial uh, requirements. So from the perspective, from, from the industry perspective, we saw uh, some, uh, some difference between the IKO and IASA approach. Why, uh, while uh, IKO is uh, focusing on uh, retrieving the, the aircraft and locating the, the FDR CVR, the IASA is most, more focusing on uh, search and rescue and making sure that possible survivors uh, will be found. In turn, uh, this, uh, this led to a, a slightly different recommend requirement orientation where IKO is focusing on uh, uh, in-flight autonomous distress tracking as a prescriptive method to achieve end-of-flight location, whereas IASA is really focusing on the end-of-flight the location. And also from a system operation, uh, the, for IKO, the operator, is in charge of getting distress tracking data. While from, the, from what we understand from IASA perspective, it's more up to SAR and ATSU to get this uh, tracking data. So these uh, additional uh, rec requirements coming from the, from the NPA, from uh, IASA, which combined also with the IKO uh, post-flight uh, requirement, um, led Aurelia to implement uh, additional functions uh, to, the, to the ELTDT. In particular, uh, we had to implement uh, crash survivability, at least for the 1 to 1.5 megahertz homing signal. Uh, we had also to make sure that this homing signal uh, can be uh, sent for a lifetime of 48 hours, even in cold environment, which has a strong impact on the, on the battery design. Uh, we, had to we have to ensure end of flight uh, detection. And for survivable crash, the location must be transmitted to the search and rescue authorities within the 20 minutes after the end of flight and with a 200 meter accuracy. From a, a power management perspective, the power autonomy um, for the duration of flight needs to be, sorry, the duration of flight without engines. So typically uh, 30 minutes plus five, 15 minutes following the end of life. And then uh, 
the ELT has to provide its uh, usual lifetime, I mean, as an ELT. We also uh, saw that the, using the emergency bus is an acceptable mean of compliance. And last, there is no way, there should be no way to disengage the system in flight uh, apart from the, from the circuit breaker. So all these requirements were investigated uh, by Aurelia at the beginning, in the, typically in the 2015, 2016. We investigated the different approaches that would allow to meet this uh, GAD and uh, autonomous distress tracking requirements. And uh, we, we, okay, we had a small bias as an ELT manufacturer, of course, but we came to the conclusion that the ELTDT is really the, the, the way uh, to move forward as, uh, as an ADT transmitter. So the LTDT in practice is really a dedicated and optimized answer to the autonomous distress tracking requirement. It just does uh, distress alerting and alert message transmission, but it does it very well. The interesting thing with ELTDT also is that it leverages the existing COSPAR-SARSAT uh, distress detection and distribution infrastructures to the, uh, to the RCCs. It also bridges uh, the, the implementation uh, with the legacy automatic fixed ELTs in terms of integration, in terms of operation or, and maintenance. ELTs are something known by uh, aircraft manufacturers. Uh, so this, is, uh, this eases a bit the, the integration. And there are some uh, specific uh, aspects to the ELT or to the ELTDT, including a very strong and uh, robust transmission, since it's a uh, low data rate and uh, burst uh, transmission, it's extremely robust. Um, it provides power and location autonomy uh, and with a reasonable amount of uh, battery because overall the, 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 the transmission does not consume a lot of power. And it allows, uh, we'll see that later, thanks to its architecture, a very low uh, nuisance triggering rate, which we understand is a key concern for the, for the airlines and for the aircraft manufacturers. So, Ultima DT. The Ultima DT is the new generation uh, uh, ELT DT from, uh, from Aurelia. Its design uh, started in the context of the Helios uh, project. Um, since uh, 2016, we are now at the, at the pro prototype, prototype uh, stage. In terms of features, uh, it's really uh, a fully compliant um, uh, ADT transmitter that complies with uh, ICAO ADT requirement with EASA location of an aircraft in distress. And also, of course, with uh, the recent ED62B requirements which now includes some uh, requirements for uh, ELTDT. It's a crash survivable uh, um, uh, product, which, uh, as we said, maximizes the probability of finding survivors uh, by search and rescue forces, thanks to a 1 to 1.5 megahertz homing signal. It's a class one device, so meaning that it stands uh, minus 40 degrees uh, temperature. Uh, one key requirement for new generation uh, ELTs is that it is compliant with uh, FAA and EASA special conditions for non-rechargeable uh, lithium batteries. Uh, then a requirement that came uh, from, the, uh, from the EASA requirements actually, the, uh, the internal trigger in flight chain is, um, is uh, qualified uh, uh, to DALC in order to provide a low nuisance activation rate. And in order to be a DALC and to reach the appropriate uh, level of reliability, uh, we have implemented actually a redundant uh, trigger in flight chain. It has an integrated uh, crash sensor uh, detection capability. So it's a bit like an ELTF, except that it's now based on uh, uh, MEMS accelerometers. Uh, it has an internal GNSS receiver in order to provide the, the location uh, autonomy, but uh, it's, it still have the possibility to receive uh, the location from the avionics through an RN-429 uh, link. 
The integration is quite easy since there is a single high speed antenna which provides both GNSS reception and 46 plus 121.5 megahertz uh, transmission. And it's a, yeah, it's a single connector antenna. And last, um, it is a COSPAR SARSAT first generation beacon, FGB, which will be upgradable to second generation beacon uh, when this will be, when SGB infrastructure will be uh, operational. So this was a, a difficult uh, choice, uh, but we really wanted to make sure that when the, 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 the system uh, uh, is introduced, it relies really on very uh, uh, mature components. So the, the COSPAR SARSAT infrastructure on one side and the ADT transmitter uh, on, the, on the other side. From an integration uh, perspective, um, uh, it's quite similar to uh, the, the ELT automatic fixed uh, integration. So the ELT itself is located at the rear of the aircraft close to the antenna. There's a cockpit control panel for manual activation, uh, as in the as with uh, again as with uh, ELT AF. But we need to add uh, a few connections uh, to the aircraft. So the first one is the trigger in flight link, um, which is done through R rank 429 and carries the label 202. So this was defined in an R rank uh, document 680. Uh, and we also need uh, uh, to send uh, data to the uh, to the ADT module through an ARANG 429. So this is the called the label 201, again, which includes the ELTDT status. We may have some additional uh, triggering interface uh, available uh, in order to, to adapt to different kinds of, um, of integration. Really, the, 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 the overall ADT system uh, is not only the ADT transmitter, but it's also the ADT module. And for this, uh, there, there's a need for a bit of uh, flexibility. From a schedule perspective, uh, the, the design and the prototypes uh, started in the framework of, uh, G, of the, the GSA funded Helios program. So in uh, 2016, the, we are now at the at the at the prototype stage. Uh, we we went already through a lot of uh, pre-qualification, and the design. Uh, so the design will be completed and certified in the framework of uh, Airbus uh, selection. Since we are now working uh, with uh, with Airbus. So the key milestones, uh, Red Label is expected by December 2021, so really uh, next year. And uh, Black Label is expected Q3 2022 in time uh, to meet the, the, the January 2023 uh, mandate. So I would like to share with you also um, uh, the, the, the the first results of a very interesting uh, uh, flight trial uh, that uh, happened uh, very recently in, uh, in November, and which really was an opportunity to test uh, the ELTDT, but actually not only the ELTDT, the overall uh, uh, autonomous distress tracking system uh, in, during uh, a real uh, flight that involved, uh, I, I would say, almost all the stakeholders uh, that were needed uh, for this uh, for for the experiment, but that would be also needed in uh, in real life. So here the experiment the experiment took place over Spain and France. So we had uh, two airlines, uh, Iberia Air France. We had the ATSUs. Uh, we had the the French MCC and the Spanish MCC. Sorry, uh, we had the, the the French and Spanish RCCs uh, too. Um, we involved uh, the, the CNES also, as well as uh, the GSA for this, uh, for this uh, experiment. And really, the goal was extremely uh, large uh, since we wanted to test uh, uh, the ATS procedures with uh, multiple airspaces, so typically here, France and Spain. Uh, we wanted to manage uh, or to, to look at the management of multiple uh, SAR regions. 
uh, we wanted to check the infrastructure performances. So here we are talking about the, the MCCs and the ability of the MCCs to detect um, an ELTDT uh, protocol and ELTDT signal. And also we wanted to check the EASA NPA requirements. Uh, so typically uh, when, the, when, the, when the aircraft is on the ground. So that was a very, uh, very complete experiment. Uh, the, the goal was not really to, to test uh, the, 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 the criteria that would trigger the ELTDT, but to make sure that when there is typically an unusual attitude, um, then we keep on transmitting uh, the, the ELTDT uh, signal, and this signal keeps uh, being received by the, by the MCCs. So this was a bit painful for the for the crew actually, um, and then uh, very interesting also um, we we had the opportunity to test a new function which is not uh, not uh, recommended uh, not uh, mandated uh, which is the remote activation and deactivation thanks to the Galileo returning service. So this uh, this new service uh, was uh, standardized uh, earlier this year uh, by uh, Eurokae, so ED uh, 277, uh, sorry, as a, as a MASPS, um, and really this this uh, capability was implemented on our ELTDT prototype, and we showed uh, and we demonstrated uh, uh, that uh, this uh, this service. Uh, works actually, and it gave the possibility to the airline to trigger remotely uh, the ELTDT and then uh, uh, to the RCC to receive uh, the, the, the location of the, of the aircraft. Interesting, uh, interesting experiment. So we don't have all the results. Um, these will be uh, available and uh, a bit later. But the, the first feedback we had from all the stakeholders was that this was successful. Uh, we had 100% uh, 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 detection, 100% uh, uh, location of um, uh, location available. So we could track really the, uh, the aircraft uh, all the time uh, uh, the distress was activated. Um, so a good, uh, really a good uh, experiment. Just to give you uh, some, uh, some elements uh, to describe a bit, a bit the, the experiment. Uh, so the, the, the test bench was installed in a Falcon aircraft. Uh, you can see also that uh, there is the, the antenna um, that provides a GPS reception and uh, um, four or six megahertz uh, transmission. The, you can see also uh, the, the manual um, cockpit control panel uh, that allows to manually activate the, the beacon. And you can see also the trajectory of the, of the aircraft uh, during the, during the, the flight uh, test. We, we cannot really see here, but uh, it in, the, the, the trajectory actually included a series of uh, tight turns. Uh, really to check again the, 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 the transmission performance uh, of the ELTDT. So as a conclusion, um, I, I would say that from uh, an industry perspective, again, we, be, we, we see that the GADS ADT implementation requirements are now reasonably stabilized, which really allows, our, allows us to finalize also our own uh, design. The EASA uh, location uh, of an aircraft in distress added a layer of uh, mandated requirements due to the focus on end of flight location, but this was uh, taken into account, I, I would say, uh, successfully. Uh, we, we see also that the ELTDT approach has been selected uh, uh, actually by most airframers, uh, again, because of the, the intrinsic uh, characteristics of the, the ELTDT concept. Ultima DT, so developed in the framework of the European Helios program, so is the, the distress tracking member of a family of new generation ELTs that meet uh, GADS, ADT, and LAD requirements, and also meet the, the requirements related to uh, lithium batteries. That's really an important aspect. And last, uh, we demonstrated uh, last month that ELTDT has reached uh, a, a good level of maturity 
uh, meeting really the ADT and LAD requirements. So we are now, now moving from a concept or a performance based concept really to, uh, to, to, uh, to something real. Uh, that can be integrated into an aircraft and that can be also integrated in a wider system um, that, um, uh, that really allows this uh, GADS uh, capability. And last, uh, we demonstrated also, even if it's, again, if it's uh, not mandatory yet, and not, uh, uh, we demonstrated the end-to-end -end feasibility of remote command service. So uh, giving uh, an airline the ability to uh, trigger uh, the remotely the, the ELTDT. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, very interesting presentation to real, to, and it's good to see real boxes in real aircraft and real flights. So uh, very, very good uh, to see. Thanks a lot. Um, for everyone, if you uh, have a question um, on this presentation and on the other question, presentations, then uh, please use the Q&A. Uh, session. There are already a uh, number of questions in the Q&A, so Emmanuel, if you can have a look at them already, and we come back to it uh, later in the Q&A session. So, yes. um, the next speaker is uh, Paul Roux. Uh, Emmanuel, if you could switch on off your video. Paul, from South Africa. Um, Paul is going to uh, talk about also ADT solutions. And uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Henk, for giving us the opportunity to present. Um, I uh, would like to introduce you to the uh, our system uh, that we're proposing for the uh, for the solution for ADT. Um, our system is called the Global Communications Platform. Uh, it's for commercial aircraft, and we we like to hold on to our slogan: "Globally secure, real-time peace of mind." So let me jump straight into it. And, uh, and give you what we came about, what we built and, and what we felt would be the requirement going forward. So the motivation behind this all was to build a system that was always on uh, so that no aircraft could ever get lost um, in the future. Um, and that was obviously, of course, post uh, MH370 and AF447 and of course others that have, that have happened in between that. So our main driver was to actually build a system that was, was based around independence of navigation, communication, power, as well as a system that was fit for purpose. And under the navigational section, we decided that we, we, we really needed to have uh, blank spots uh, excluded from, from, from a transmission perspective. And we wanted to make sure that we could transmit over mountainous areas and oceans, oceans and, and the likes. Global coverage obviously was mandated uh, in terms of, of the GADS um, concept of operations. And of course, we wanted to overcome the lack of uh, maintenance for uh, terrestrial based infrastructures like very high omnidirectional radio beacons. From a communications perspective, we were very clear. We wanted to be able to record the positions in, in, in milliseconds if required, as well as overcome the limitations of current reporting systems that might have lost timestamps or positions not transmitted. Power, critical for us. We wanted a complete independence of any aircraft system. And of course, the system that we wanted to build needed to be generic. So we wouldn't have to worry about uh, specific systems for specific OEMs, as well as being able to fine tune the specific uh, functions for each aircraft. The development of the Satellite GCP, we obviously just an objective, global location of aircraft, minimal installation time that was critical for us, both uh, from a perspective of future line fit, but, but primarily uh, on the on the, uh, the retrofit side, we needed a compact device uh, completely uh, we needed something that was independent of aircraft systems, which obviously we put into our, our motivation. We wanted something that could secure the data transmission real time and uh, track the aircraft uh, via a secure terrestrial portal. The result was a communications platform, as you can see on the right here, uh, that was responsive to changing regulations and also client uh, re requirements for global tracking. We needed to be installed um, under four hours, uh, and in this instance, an HX, so a standard HX. As you can see, the size um, in terms of its millimeter and its weight, which um, met the requirements of being below uh, two and a half, uh, 2.5 kilos, independent of all aircraft systems and, and, and in this instance, OEMs. Secure communications via the uh, satellite uh, rays, uh, global satellite rays, and of course, a secure based uh, tracking system and alerting portal. 
The, as you can see on this aircraft, we, we, we fitted it to a, a South African Airways aircraft um, uh, with the, the installation, as you can see, where our antenna is placed there. We have a, a, an EASA certified solution in this instance, a reciprocal to FAA. Uh, we did a number of world firsts in terms of autonomous global tracking and commercial aircraft from 2016. Uh, the automated transmission of formerly, uh, formerly known dark zones and oceans, we were able to overcome. Uh, we believed that we had a GADS ADT message transmission and verified as tested uh, post the flight through the flight data recorder download. Uh, the automated distress triggers we had tested, and I'll show you further on in our slides going forward. We were able to manually uh, activate the distress trigger, both from the flight operations on the ground, as well as the flight crew. Uh, the most important for us was, of course, the system was always on and uh, not reachable. Uh, we don't want to go down the, the, from, from the pilots in the, in the room um, in terms of, of tamper proof, but it was in an area located that uh, was really uh, only available to the maintenance crew. We exceeded the 4015 by including trigger information. This is additional information uh, that what formed the trigger, so altitude or incorrect uh, attitude of the aircraft, speed and the likes. Aircraft state data, we, we uh, were able to pull this data from the FDR. I'll go into that a little later. And of course, the supporting situational data encapsulated in the real time transmission of the ADT instance. So in, in short, additional data that showed why the aircraft went into this trigger state. And of course, um, what we're very proud of is that our battery life exceeds the six, 60 hours um, in terms of uh, the functionality for the duration of the remainder of the flight. Moving on, there we go. So the system autonomous to resilience uh, to the aircraft and system failures, we had an independent location data. So that was uh, long and lat, date and time was completely independent of the aircraft systems. Independent ground speed, we were able to have an independent bearing and direction, independent altitude, uh, and of course, totally independent of the power uh, from, from an aircraft perspective. And I'm sure I'll get asked questions on that a little later, but I, I have the answers for that. In terms of our coverage, these are the tests we started running uh, as early as 2016. Um, and as you can see, Johannesburg to Perth, we have a Johannesburg to Hong Kong flight, uh, Johannesburg to London, and, and I'll, I'll dwell on this, Johannesburg to Sao Paulo. And you can see there are independent uh, periodic reports as in those uh, small dots of, of yellow on the screen. But you'll see towards the middle of the Atlantic, you will found that um, we had a very, very high rate of transmission. And that was based on a request from the, the airline uh, to determine uh, the coverage from a communications or SAT communications. And in this instance, we dropped this down to uh, below 30 seconds and provided them a complete uh, coverage uh, perspective from from a from a high rate perspective. What we found, uh, what was a requirement, was that uh, we would we would need to be able to customize the reporting intervals. Um, it, it covers multiple different areas in terms of costs and and relation relational costs to transmitting data via satellite. And in this instance, we were able to provide the client, and the, these are just really. Uh, rounded off values, 30, 60, two minutes, five minutes, 10, 10 minutes, and back to three minutes. And these are all done on the fly. So the, the operational uh, ground operations can change these intervals as and when they, uh, they feel um, that they require a high rate of tracking. This is directly communicated on the fly with the aircraft. Warning alerts and situational alerts. Um, this obviously understood as geofencing and we, we have another example of, of uh, the ADT message, but in this instance, uh, crossing a specific geofence, and this could include hotspots, it could include no-fly zones, particular to some of the Central Europe with MH17 being shot down. Obviously, this could have been avoided if there was a, a no-fly zone allocated at the time, and there was an ability to provide this data to the airlines at the time. As you can see on the right, it's a notification. This appears uh, at the end. So in this instance, we did a, a test um, to, to, uh, to Hong Kong, we had a, an interval of, of five minutes and we were alerted at about two o'clock in the morning uh, in as much as a high rate transmission had activated the alerting platform. This had alerted us via our mobile devices. Uh, we went and logged onto the platform, obviously being secure. And we picked up that there was a high rate of transmission straight over the Banda Archer area. Um, we weren't too sure what this was about. Um, and the best we could do was have a look at conditions. And in this time there was uh, the, this area had 
quite a few tropical cyclones. We decided to part of the feature of our portal was to put a real time, um, a real time weather overlay. We did that immediately and de determined that the aircraft had flown into a tropical cyclone. Um, and as you can see at the rate of transmission here, um, it, it ended up being almost a solid white line in terms of the trigger event. This was fully automated. This alerted us that the aircraft had gone into a state beyond its normal flight. On close inspection, we had a look. Uh, as you can see in the beginning, the default intervals are five minutes. Um, and uh, the first trigger event was an automated trigger event, uh, alerted us to an, a dramatic altitude change from a storm perspective. And there, thereafter, multiple alert triggers continued to trigger and maintain the alert status, which obviously gave us the high rate of transmission um, for this particular interval. What we've done, just to exaggerate and, and show you from a graphic perspective, is the next slide shows us where the trigger started, why it started. Obviously, in this instance, altitude, there are multiple additional triggers that we provided data for. Um, and that gave us the ability to high rate track the aircraft from a position location perspective. So you'll see in the next slide, um, this was a, a slide that was activated by ground operations. This is also done on the fly below. You'll see in red that uh, the last default interval was at five minutes. We then uh, got the ground crew to activate the emergency uh, activation from the ground. You'll see the timing delay is, is less than 12 seconds between the two intervals. And then uh, the ground crew re-deactivated uh, the emergency and resume the default position, as you can see, five minute intervals above. Just in this instance, um, obviously, this, this was a, a function that was proposed uh, within GADS, and we believe we, we've met those requirements in this instance for, for testing. Obviously, there's a bunch of swim lanes that are followed if you cannot get hold of the aircraft. This is normal AOC type functions going forward. In terms of data security, we believe that this is part of the situation we find ourselves in today with the digital era and uh, we wanted to make sure that the access and ownership of the data was limited to the customer only obviously uh, with the ladder coming forward uh, which i'll mention later on in the slide uh, this data is also uh, provided to the ladder uh, automated in, in instances the data is secure aes 256 bit encryption and pci3 we have uh, data which is fips 142 compliant we also allow for customized encryption from a client perspective. We make facility for that to take place. By default, all the tracking data is available in real time, but retained for post-flight analysis and download. And of course, data is secured in secure scalable servers. Obviously, we, we have uh, this link to servers around the world and not one server retains the data for retention for the client. So to get back to our response to ConOps, the CONOPS for GADS CONOPS. Are we autonomous? We believe we are from a communications and power navigation perspective. Do we have global coverage? Yes, we do. Tracking intervals from a standard 4015 in November of 2018, we were able to meet those conditions for standard tracking. We were able to also on the fly adjust those tracking intervals for, for operators and the automated uh, ADT meshes and manual activations since 2016. Automated warnings, situational alerts, as I showed you earlier, the geofences, hotspots, no-fly zones. And in this instance, from, an, from a, an ICAO perspective, the uncertainty alert and distress phase, each one of these is customizable uh, to the operator's aircraft flight envelopes within the OEM specification. So we believe we met that. Uh, the ADT emergency, this is the interesting part of our system, algorithmic in-flight determination of aircraft state. We look at each aircraft state and the envelope it's in and determine its functionality from there. Supportive data from the FDR, a question that I'm sure will come up later um, via the FDR, automated and terrestrial and also crew activation uh, from the flight operations section. Uh, we, we can activate high rate tracking with additional aircraft state data, again from the FDR, initiates automated alerts and initiates population of the ICAO ladder with supporting event data. We believe we've met that as well. Uh, from a PEF point of end of flight, which uh, comes down to Guillaume's uh, application or the, the EASA CAT Gen MPA 210, the acceptable means of compliance. Uh, with com combination of an ELT, we meet those, uh, app, uh, th those requirements and minimum operating um, fields. And the point of end of flight with regards to six nautical miles within 200 meters, 95% of the time for post-flight localization and recovery. 
I'm unfortunately can't see my ticks here. So I'm just going to move the video screen to the one side. Sorry about that, guys. Right. This particular slide is data that we pulled uh, from that flight that you saw, that aircraft that we had uh, allocated. This is five minute intervals. This was data post the flight and data post the, the event uh, around Banda Archer. This is really just a, a flight into Hong Kong of that exact same aircraft I showed you earlier. And it shows you what we can do with the data. Now, this is five minute interval data, but uh, we have data that we can position at 30 hertz and provide a much smoother um, post flight uh, flight of uh, an inbound flight into Hong Kong. Um, so we've, we've given you a brief overview of what uh, the Satos GCP does um, and, and how this can be used from both uh, the NTSB BEA uh, post-flight recovery, also uh, to go and search for the aircraft in terms of search and rescue and the likes. And this is just flying into Hong Kong International Airport. Um, I thought we'd just add it in to show you the data that we can occur and pull together. And uh, that is my presentation. Thanks very much for giving us the opportunity. I'm, I'm sorry it was a bit fast, uh, but uh, we, we're probably a bit short of time. My apologies. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Paul. And uh, good to see that this aircraft landed safely at Hong Kong. Um, thank you for your, your presentation. Uh, I see questions coming in. Uh, so some of these questions are all already being answered. If you have questions to Paul on his presentation, please uh, use the Q&A box for your uh, questions and we come back in the Q&A session. The next speaker is uh, Claude. Uh, Claude, can you switch on your camera, please? Very good to see you. Um, I was not able to introduce you uh, earlier. I will do that now. Uh, Claude um, is an executive expert at Airbus on CNNS. Has a long career of uh, 35 years um, on all aircraft uh, models of Air Airbus. Um, he has contributed in uh, from the beginning in many groups uh, to the GATS. Uh, from the IATA Tracking uh, Task Force to the GETS Advisory Group, uh, and also in um, the context of uh, Airing AWC. Um, in uh, 2020, so this year, uh, Claude was uh, nominated as Vice Chair of the CNS ATM Committee of ICCIA, the C Industry Council, and he is Chairman of the ICAO ICNS uh, Task Force of ICAO, which is integrated CNS and Spectrum. And Claude will present how the GATS is coming together in the airframe and uh, this from an Airbus perspective. Claude, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Hank. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to provide you with uh, Airbus inputs regarding solution and implementation of GATS. Uh, so the GATS concept itself will have a quick, a quick look because obviously with all participants, you have now a better understanding of what is GATS. And I will focus only on two items of the three main GATS components, which are ADT, Autonomous Distress Tracking, and PFLR, Post-Flight Localization Recovery. So you know perfectly these three main components. Uh, so I will cover only ADT, which is uh, the Distress Tracking, and PFLR. An important message uh, among the fact that we will comply with uh, ICAO documents, typically Annex 6, as well as the ICAO DOC 10054, uh, an important message for the airlines. Uh, so airline role is really important as ADT is really placed under their responsibility. So they need to check their relevant regulation with their own NA, make sure that all the concerned aircraft are fitted with the right technologies. And the most important for me is to manage the alert generated by the tracking system and establish accordingly the procedure supporting the GATS. So this is very important for the airlines huh? because as a framework, we can propose solution, but the airline need to put them in shape after all. So for ADT, I will not go deeper. The only thing I want to mention is that the mandate is now January 2023. Uh, even if we obtain, I will say, a delay in the mandate is still very tight. Uh, so we are running, but during this pandemic period, it's very tough to achieve this date. Distress tracking. So we need to provide 3D or 4D position. Must be activated within five seconds upon distress de detection. Obviously, try to uh, have the site determination with this six nautical mile radius. And we are using a spectrum uh, protected for distress. 
So must be resilient as uh, noticed by uh, Aurelia and by Sato uh, to fault uh, of aircraft power, communication and navigation, and obviously send the signal to search and rescue. So ADT is today described also by Airing Report 680, which was based obviously on ICAO requirement and the various individual civil aviation authority initiative. The Airbus IDT solution will be based on ELT-DT, Emergency Locator Transmitter Distress Tracking. So this one is a well-proven and secured uh, space and road segment and procedure of COSPAS RSAT, so direct signal to search and rescue. So we want really to continue uh, the way we were using previously uh, ELT because we consider this is the, the best way to do it. The idea is also to minimize the impact on our different type of aircraft. Uh, in order to provide common solutions. Obviously, uh, as mentioned in the various documents, the distress will be only able to be deactivated using the same mechanisms and activated. So in other means, uh, the pilot cannot deactivate if the, same, uh, if the trigger is not the same that activates the alert. ELT will be standalone autonomously powered and will be crash survivable. So we have three main components for this ADT. The ADT module host, uh, which is a distress event detection and trigger, according to a, a Euro KDE 237 trigger scenario, plus internal Airbus scenario. The transmitter itself with an, an internal GNSS receiver and a battery, and the control panel and the antenna. So in terms of uh, principle on board the aircraft, so we have all the aircraft avionics, which are, we we'll say, providing various information. Those information are then managed by the ADT module, which will trigger or not the alert to the transmitter. So the computational algorithm is embedded in the ADT module, which is, I will say, the heart of the system. So then we have the transmitter with its antenna, which will transmit the signal of alert to the COSPAR SARSAT constellation. Obviously, we have also maintenance because now with this ELT DT is, I will say, more than the classical standalone ELT. And so we need to be sure that this one is well working. So we are connected then to the COSPAR SARSAT constellation and we are using protected spectrum, spectrum as mentioned, for the 406 MHz signal for search and rescue and 121.5 for the omic signal in VHF and last, a GNSS reception for the position of the aircraft. An important message, we need to ensure that the nuisance alert to SAR should not exceed, exceed sorry, more than two per 100,000 flight hour. So this has been demonstrated according to our, I uh, will say, test made in laboratory in simulator and we'll start soon our flight test. In terms of physical implementation, uh, as mentioned uh, by Aurelia, this is uh, the classical, I will say, implementation with the control panel in the cockpit. The ADT module, which is part of the avionic in the avionic bay. The transmitter ELT itself in the rear part of the aircraft in the ceiling and the ELT DT antenna. So this is what we have on all our programs and uh, fleet, typically S320, S330, S350, including uh, S3, uh, sorry, A220 family for Airbus Canada. So in summary, all aircraft Mali family are covered with ADT. Uh, interesting for airlines, this solution will be available also for retrofit via Airbus service bulletin. So then we'll be able also to install the same system on the aircraft which want to have this installation. So now uh, a look on the post-flight localization and recovery, where the data recovery is also important. So here we have the Annex 6, which was also updated, uh, and it is looking for an application for a new type certificate filed or on after 2021. Here we want to have what we call an Airbus Safety Enhancement Initiative. So it means that we are equipping our aircraft, uh, I will say, not exactly for the date, but not very far from the date, because we consider that PFLR is an important uh, aspect in order to recover the data. I will now go in detail regarding uh, the applicable of uh, 25-hour capacity, data link recorder, uh, dual recorder, and so on. 
So post-flight localization and recovery is also defined by Airwink Report 681, based on ICAO requirement and also CAA initiative. As the suggested implementation in the document refer to deployable recorder or data streaming. The Airbus PFLR solution will be based on automatic deployable flight recorder. Again, this is an Airbus initiative. So in the principle, we are taking into account various avionics parameters for recording. So we are sending those information to the combined voice and data recorder and also to this deployable recorder, which is made of the heart of the deployable recorder itself with a cover, a release recorder unit, a hatch in which we have also sensor for deployments. And we have also as an interface, a recorder interface unit. So this allows to share the same information on both recorder, the combined fixed one and the deployable one on the rear part of the aircraft. Another also uh, performance to be checked and to be validated. This is the unintended deployment failure condition that should be demonstrated as extremely remote, typically 10 minus seven per flight hour. So we need to demonstrate that deployable will not deploy in a specific condition with this, uh, we'll say a performance requirement. Regarding the physical implementation, uh, deployable will be installed on long range family, typically on an S350, S330 and S321 XLR. Our objective is to start the forward fit in 2023. So you have the localization of those various components, so the deployable recorder, recorder interface unit, and combined voice and data recorder on board the aircraft. So if we have a look on the various pieces uh, of the system, so we have the automatic deployable flight recorder itself, so which will record copied voice, data link, and flight data. We have also provision for video, uh, so-called flight crew machine interface, and this system will be capable of 25 hours of voice recording. So the deployment will occur in only in two conditions. One, the aircraft is underwater, three meters of water, three meters of water, or during, I will say, uh, when the aircraft is break in two pieces uh, during flight. This deployable recorder will emit also on 406 MHz signal and will emit also on the ohmic signal uh, 121.5. So here you have the uh, various part of the deployable, the host part, the trigger leasing, and the floatable part itself with the content of the data. And you have here, you'll see here, sorry, a vertical uh, fin in which we have the recorder, which is installed. You can have a zoom on it here. So combined voice data recorder, classical one, equipped with 37.5 kilohertz ULB and also capable of 25 hours recording. We have provision also for video and the recorder interface unit, which allow uh, to make the interface between the two recorders and which allow also to read out the content of the deploy recorder, which is not really accessible. And so providing this will help the maintenance for airlines. For the single A family, uh, so-called uh, S320, uh, we do not have a deployable recorder. This one is only proposed as an option. Nevertheless, we have implemented a dual combined voice and data recorders. So this will start uh, very soon because January 2021, which is tomorrow, and all aircraft will be equipped with a dual combined voice and data recorder. So in summary, regarding the ADFR implementation, uh, we have ADFR proposed on all our long range aircraft and it is proposed as an option on the S320 family. We have other devices also, which are installed on Airbus aircraft, uh, which we help to recover the data. So once the uh, ADFR will float, then we have also the possibility to record, to, sorry, to retrieve uh, the fixed recorder using the 90 days ULB attached to the recorder or the low frequency ULB, which is attached to the primary structure. Interesting aspect is that we have a better range with this low frequency uh, uh, ULB attached to the primary structure. So a small animation in order to try to summarize what we have, in fact, 
So we have the ELT and the deployable installed on the aircraft. So in normal mode, we received the position from the various constellations. Then we continue the flight and we still be updated with the position. And if we are going in an uh, autonomous distress tracking mode, so then we will activate, according to the triggers, the signal of emergency 4 or 6 as per the uh, Eurokai criteria defined in the document plus some Airbus one. So unfortunately, if the aircraft crash, we continue to transmit uh, on both frequency to alert uh, the uh, mission control center and the rescue coordination center. And then we can have also uh, the uh, deployable recorder itself generating the 406 signal and the homing signal once the aircraft is sinking under the water. And so we hope then that rescue will come very soon in order to recover first survivor, second recreage, but most important uh, data recovery in order to understand what happened and make associated correction. So this is a summary of both solutions, both components, ADT and ADFR as applicable to the Airbus fleet. So we are really, I will say, covering uh, the Airbus fleet with this, uh, I will say, uh, mandate uh, by ICAO and AISA, plus our own Airbus initiative for safety. So in conclusion, uh, we are full compliant with the regarding the implementation of the uh, aircraft system for IDT and PFLR. Uh, we are compliant also with various regulations, uh, including 25 hour CVR and uh, ULB. And so the benefits we are looking for, for sure, are compact solution for customer, robust solution, which is based on existing Cosparsasat uh, satellite payloads. We have a combined and deployable recorder for an improved dispatch reliability, even if we have only two fixed combined recorders. We have fleet commonality, and we consider that tracking and recorder are fully part of the safety continuous improvement. So thank you for your attention. If we have questions, let me know. Thank you, Claude. Uh, very interesting to see how, how it all comes together in uh, how the gets comes together in uh, in aircraft in airframes uh, uh, from an Airbus perspective. So thank you very much. I see also questions uh, to you coming in uh, on the Q and A. So if you can uh, start looking at that, then we uh, pick them up uh, later in the Q and A session uh, after the final presentation uh, sure. this afternoon. Thank so you thanks, uh, Claude. Um, so the next uh, speaker and presentation is uh, Mercedes, uh, please. Yeah, there you are. And Mercedes is going to um, uh, talk about uh, the GETS uh, from a general aviation perspective, uh, which is also a very important uh, perspective that uh, the GETS is uh, supporting. So the floor is yours, uh, Mercedes. So hello, hello everybody. Uh, so as Hank mentioned, I'm going to present the operational demonstration of CAT concepts for general aviation. In particular, we are going to, I'm going to present some uh, solutions uh, for general aviation that were developed under the frame of a, a project funded by the European Genesis Agency, so-called GRIMAS. So GRIMAS is a project which is still ongoing, that is uh, led by Thales Alenia Space France, and we are in consortium with ECA Group, with AOPA, ASEGNA, which is the air navigation service provider for several countries in Africa, Estimate Crow Electronics, Barcelona Flight School, and ourselves, Build the Labs. So with this project, we wanted to give an answer to the need of the RCCs, AOPA, and ICAO to improve the general aviation safety. And how we did this? So we de developed some solutions on one side, uh, ECA developed a LTTT second generation beacon for general aviation, which had to be a small and low cost beacon for them. And we also developed uh, solutions to improve the, the information management uh, in the case of emergency for the RCCs. And as a second step, we tested these uh, solutions in several flight campaigns. But before entering into GRIMAS and into the solutions we developed, uh, I would like to give you some figures. So you have to take into account that there are 840 rescue operations in Europe, approximately per year, which has a cost of 30 million euros. 
As you can see in the figures below, 82% of aviation accidents are of general aviation with survivors. 17% are general aviation accidents without survivors. And 1% are, no, are accidents, but which are not from general aviation. So 99% of accidents comes from general aviation. And what about the SAR equipment? So 50% of general aviation has no equipment at all. 35% has PLBs and only 15% has ELD. So there is room of improvement on the SAR equipment for general aviation. So if we have 99% of accidents coming from general aviation, this means that majority of workload by the RCCs uh, comes from this type of aircraft. And this is also what was expressed uh, directly to us by the RCCs when visiting them, that the main workload comes from this type of aircraft. They have plenty of, of, of alerts from them. However, the connection between the RCCs and the operators, like for example, the ATCs or the, the operators of the aircraft are done manually by phone calls or whatever. So it has to be uh, improved and, and automatized in order to reduce time of response. Also, uh, as a context and for the project of Frigemas, we, have, we took into account that uh, there was an evolution of the search and rescue, as also mentioned in other presentations of this, of this webinar, like the Galileo return link, uh, which is intensively discussed uh, for PLBs, EPIRs and LTBTs, like for example, the remote activation that was also tested in our, in our project. And also there are uh, a change in aviation around swing concepts, uh, but which are not uh, dealing with search and rescue or hardly dealing with search and rescue. And only for commercial aviation in any case, not for general aviation. So within Green Mass, we wanted to propose and demonstrate innovative solutions based on MERSAR system and using Galileo return link to improve safety and security of air navigation. So which are the solutions that we developed uh, in Grimas? So first of all, uh, as mentioned before, ECA developed a low cost beacon LTDT for general aviation. You can see a prototype of the beacon developed in the picture on, in this slide. Okay, it, had, it was a portable beacon so that it could be moved uh, with the pilot to any aircraft and configured every time uh, we were going to fly. Then we also developed a beacon registration web service for both pilots and airplanes because it was a, a request from the RCCs which mentioned that they were uh, missing sometimes data from the pilots and, and or sometimes the data from the pilot uh, that was in the databases was obsolete and didn't correspond to the current pilot. So for the purpose of this project, we created uh, a special web service for this. Then we also, for the purpose of this project, created a, a, a repository, uh, we call it LADR, so location of an aircraft in distress repository, uh, developed for the purpose of this project only for these demonstrations, and the alerts detected by the MELUT were uploaded into that uh, repository, as we will see later. And finally, we mm, developed a software, an emergency management software for the RCCs, with the objective to improve the communication with them, between them and, and all the actors of the, of the search and rescue chain, and the most important, to decrease the time of response. Okay. All these solutions, it's important to remark that were developed together with the Spanish Air Force, the Spanish RCC, and with the Spanish Maritime Rescue Center, SASEMAR. Because even if this project is mainly focused on aviation, we also uh, invited SASEMAR uh, to provide them with our requirements so that we could have several uh, rescue centers involved. So how these solutions developed uh, enter into place in the case of an emergency? First of all, before flying, the pilot has to unregister. So we did uh, that the, uh, the pilot personal information and the aircraft details had to be introduced into the web service that we created. 
the pilot had to create only once his profile with his data protected by user and password. And every time he was going to fly, he could uh, include the aircraft he was going to use because this kind of pilots change uh, very soon, uh, very frequently from, from aircraft. Also, as we were using a portable beacon, so we linked the beacon, the pilot link the beacon with his mobile phone with a QR code to the, to the web service, as you can see in the picture. So the pilot was in this time linked his profile and his data with the aircraft with the beacon. Like this, we could have before flying the beacon registration database with the beacon ID information, aircraft information, and pilot personal contact info. Okay, this part was developed uh, with the consortium, but in collaboration with a pilot from uh, Barcelona Flight School and AOPA. So, if nothing happens, that's all. Uh, nothing else to be done. However, if something happens and the beacon is triggered, then we have that the pilot on one side is notified by his mobile phone because the mobile phone is linked to the beacon as mentioned before. So it can receive the alert through the mobile phone. Mobile phone can also be used for other purpose, like for example, uh, configuring the beacon or doing some, some, some queries to the beacon. But in this case, when the beacon is, is triggered, it is alert to the mobile phone. And the most important, it's received by the Cospas Sarsat uh, chain. For this project, it was received by Thales, Thales Alien Space uh, Meolut. And the Meolut uploaded this information into the ladder that, that we had created for this project. Okay, for the ladder, the information was uploaded in XML format, which is according to what is described in the GATS. Here you have an example of some tests. On the right, you have the XML, the XML file generated in the project and uh, with the different uh, uh, fields that maybe some of you are already familiarized, but the date of the alert, time, latitude, longitude, and some information about the aircraft, alert type, and the beacon ID. But this will, uh, all this part will be more uh, detailed later on in the second presentation by, by Ian. So, also, uh, when the alert is triggered, uh, the information is put in the ladder, as mentioned, and then it's automatically received by the software uh, of the RCC, the software that we developed called Mercury. Mercury can receive the alert either from the lab, the lab or also in the conventional way by the MCC in C185 format. But for this test, we, we tested the ladder part. The software generates an acoustic alert, automatically decodes the beacon ID, locates the alert signal in a map and reads pilots and aircraft information from the beacon registration database. Here I put a screenshot of Mercury doing some tests. So on the left, you can see the message received uh, during the test. Well, at that moment, we call it DTR because uh, the database was called DTR, now it's LAD. And then, well, the software has different uh, um, stage depending on the uh, part of the of the emergency that we, where we are in the uncertain certainty uh, alert distress or, or once it's closed it has main information the map with the position of the alert uh, beacon registry uh, distress messages and so on and then here just i put another screenshot also with uh, during the flights that we did uh, the different positions of the of the aircraft in this thread that were received in an acoustic manner and also visually manner by the by the software okay, more information about the mercury software you could uh, contact me separately and i could give it to you this was as mentioned uh, developed together with uh, with um, uh, spanish rcc and they put the requirements to us also, so last but not least, uh, Mercury, uh, once receives uh, the, the, the information from the ladder, the alert, and also goes to the pilot data way website to get information from the pilot and aircraft, it also connects to Eurocontrol database through the Eurocontrol B2B services to download the flight plan of that aircraft. Okay, 
so that the RCC does not have to contact the AGC to receive the flight plan, which they told us sometime was not complete, but could automatically uh, download it uh, from the Eurocontrol database uh, in case the flight plan has been generated and uploaded there, of course. But we tested it during the flight. And in the end, it generates a cost plus surcharge report at the end of the event so that the RCC can deliver it to the MCC and, and, and be part of the cost plus surcharge uh, reporting. So, all these solutions, as mentioned, were tested in a real environment. So, in September 2019, we simulated accidents with a Cessna aircraft and a Robinson 44 helicopter to test uh, several things, but the main important ones are the automatic trigger of the beacon, of the second generation beacon, in case of violent shock in the air, the abnormal descent rate due to pilot fins, for example, the remote activation of the beacon from ground using the return link message, and also, we wanted to test that Mercury receives the alerts and the flight plans every time there is a, a distress. So here I, I put some, some pictures of the flight campaign with the different aircraft we used. And I don't know if you can see on the right, there is a, a small picture of the inside uh, where we can see the beacon on ground, where we, we located it there for, for the tests. So the outcomes of the tests were uh, successful. We had a good alert signal reception on ground. We have also rescue entities attending the campaign, which were glad to see the, these results and remarked the importance of improving the management on the distress alerts, on reducing their workload also on distress events because they, they, they all, all what facilitates the uh, management of the emergency is well received on their side and also improve the access to data for the aircraft. It's, it's uh, something that they remarked uh, several times. So then both RCCs and MRCC, MRCCs were encouraging us to continue working on this. And I wanted to include here, so we took some videos and uh, I will give you the link later on uh, to the video of this campaign, but some interviews we did to the person, to the people attending uh, in September, the, the flights. So for example, the Eulalia, the head of Barcelona Maritime Rescue Coordination Center was impressed by the way that we, we could activate the beacon uh, remotely from ground. Okay, she said, uh, it, uh, at least from her known, uh, doesn't exist for the peers and they would like to have it on maritime. And also, uh, she, she said that they lose a lot of time to recover information on the beacon owner. So similar as with the, the same message was given to us by the RCCs, but here in the interview was also said by the MRCC. So the, having a dynamic and user-friendly database like the one we did in this project for them was thought could be very beneficial. Also, uh, the, when we interview Carlos, uh, the helicopter, uh, rescue helicopter commander from Sasemar, in his side, he was uh, interested by the automatic trigger of the beacon and also by the beacon portability. Okay, so for them, uh, in case they could, the crew could take the beacon uh, after an accident with them, he thought could be uh, a very good solution, a new solution. Martin from AOPA, for example, said that uh, thanks to reducing the amount of time in searching operations could increase the change of survivability of people. So remember we have a high percentage of uh, people surviving, sur that survive to an accident of general aviation and also reduce the cost of the overall search and rescue operation. And people from ASEGNA said that uh, now in their case, they are having many problems with the information on search and rescue systems in Africa. So uh, all what deals with improving the management of search and rescue operations 
can help them to better organize themselves and to improve their response. So, as a conclusion, we developed innovative solutions to improve safety and security of air navigation and to, to enhance, to improve the management of those operations or try to improve them at least. Uh, as mentioned, this solution were in collaboration uh, with the Spanish Air Force and Maritime Rescue Center. So I'm repeating this, but this is important because finally they are the final users of it and the requirements were very appreciated uh, by us. And they, they are willing, they mentioned, they are willing to implement this. And uh, important to remark that the response time of the RCCs will, uh, can, can be significantly reduced thanks to these solutions. And as mentioned in the beginning, 82% of survivors to a general accident can benefit for this reduction of time of response. So that's not the end of Grimas. We have more flight campaigns to come. It was just the, the, the first flight campaign, the first test, but we have more to come in beginning 2021. So hope to see some of you or whoever who, who wants to attend uh, in the UK will be the next uh, campaigns. So you could see all this in real. So uh, we invite to all of you to, to come. And if you want to see what you will be able to see in the UK here in the presentation, you will have a link to a video of these flights campaigns so that you can see what you can, can find in, in the UK in the future. And I, it's everything on my side. So thank you everybody for your attention and any question. Thank you, Mercedes. And um, questions are coming in on the uh, Q&A uh, form. So please have a look there. If uh, for all, if you have questions uh, on this presentation, please uh, fill them in on the Q&A form and we will come back to it in the Q&A session. So thanks. Um, the, the last presentation for the second webinar, and we have heard the term ladder uh, already uh, many times uh, over the past presentations. And we are going to learn all about the ladder uh, from, uh, from Ian, from Arkeo. So Ian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hank. Um, so this is going to be a, a fairly swift overview. I know mean, we're a little bit behind uh, time, but I'll try to cover all the important elements. Um, so we'll start with a very quick uh, overview of the Annex 6 provisions. I'm aware that I think you've done the kind of introduction to the GADS concept and covered a lot of this, so I won't, I won't labour this point. There's a couple of interesting uh, elements of the standards in Annex 6 that I think really are relevant for discussion of the ladder. Uh, the first one is that the uh, requirements in Annex 6 for a location of an aircraft in distress are not technology specific. So uh, we describe them as performance based and there's a bit of a discussion about uh, how performance based they really are. Um, but uh, in, in essence, what we look at is the requirement to be able to transmit that information at one minute intervals or less from which the position of the aircraft can be determined. And we don't really go into any details of, of the, how that's done and the, what the different solutions could be. So we're aware that there are uh, multiple solutions that would meet the location of an aircraft in distress uh, requirements. And in fact, we've, we've heard of two of them today. So there are two different alternative solutions already developed and, and there are obviously more than two. Uh, the, the, um, the other point that's relevant from this slide, it's already been mentioned by a couple of the people is that we had originally 1st of January, 2021 as the forward equipage date for um, aircraft being equipped with devices that will um, enable the location of an aircraft in distress. And obviously, as, as you're now aware, that's moved back to January 2023. So plenty of time to get all the elements in place to make sure that we can meet that and provide um, a fully operational GAD system, of which the ladder, we believe, is a fairly key part. So again, uh, talking about distress tracking, um, we've heard various people mention it, and, and I'm sure you've just covered it in the basics this morning, uh, this requirement to have a one nautical mile, sorry, one minute position uh, information uh, with the intent of, of establishing the last position of the aircraft to within six nautical mile radius. Although, in fact, the standard is fairly clear that that six nautical mile is, is an intent rather than a requirement. The requirement is, is on the uh, transmission of information at one minute intervals or less. And obviously the, the need for that to be both uh, activated manually by the crew, but also automatically in case of, of a distress condition. 
And I think we've already seen that definition as well. The aircraft behavior, if left uncorrected, that will result in an accident. So that's what we're defining as, as the distress condition. Now, in terms of the, the ladder itself and the need for the ladder, I really want to focus on a couple of other parts of the Annex 6 provisions that we haven't really uh, discussed at all. And in particular, if we look at 618.3, we'll see that the operator has a requirement to make this position information available to the organizations that are defined by the state of the operator. So it's been mentioned before that, that uh, in Annex 6, we really put the onus on the operator to be uh, managing this uh, aircraft tracking functions and particularly the location of an aircraft in distress. And in fact, that extends to the, the dissemination of the information regarding the position of the aircraft. Um, when we're talking about the different organizations that are required to receive it, obviously, these are specified in detail in Appendix 9, and they include air traffic service units and search and rescue coordination centers. But also it includes um, anyone else that the state feels should need to have that information. So this could be, for example, an accident investigation uh, department or, uh, or Ministry of Transport. So really the, the problem for the operator then becomes if they're in possession of this information. They're the custodians of the location of the aircraft in distress information, and they, they are responsible, according to the standards in Act 6, of making that information available to the relevant air traffic service units, to the search and rescue RCCs, and to these other, these other entities that are defined by the state of the operator to, according to the need. Um, and the question is, is how are they supposed to do that, uh, especially considering a, a global operation where the ANSU and the RCCs could be potentially on the other side of the world? Uh, the GADS concept originally, and, and certainly in the GADS version 6 card, calls for an information management solution, a, a means to make that information available. Uh, and in fact, this is, this is what the role of the ladder fulfills. So uh, if we haven't already made it completely clear, the ladder stands for location of an aircraft in distress repository. Uh, those of you who've been following GADS from the beginning will know that it used to be called the DTR, the Distress Tracking Repository. Uh, and it kind of changed along the way just to be to add a bit more clarity for its role. And so the intent of the ladder really is to enable the operators to meet this, this uh, obligation to make the information available. And it does that by requiring that the information goes into the ladder and then we give access to uh, all of the relevant organizations, the various air traffic service units, the RCCs, and anyone else that the state of the operator defines as, as needing to have access. But we provide them with access to the ladder and therefore they can access the position information from the aircraft in distress and, the, and thus the, uh, the information is distributed according to the requirements of Annex 6. So that's really the basic concept. It's fairly, it's fairly straightforward in terms of what it's designed to do. It's designed to be uh, a central point of contact. Um, coming back to that first slide when we talked about the, the standards of Annex 6 being technology agnostic, Again, this is another key feature of the ladder because what we're seeing is that there are multiple solutions being developed which meet the ADT requirements. And so um, in order to not have multiple different platforms where the RCCs and the ANSIs would potentially have to go and find this information, the ladder brings everything together into one central point. So from, from, from that perspective, it's irrelevant whether it's an ELT, DT, or it's a satellite system, or whether it's one of the other systems that are out there being developed because all of those systems just connect to the ladder as, as contributors and the ladder um, accumulates all that data and makes it available to everyone. And so it's a single point of reference for all those organizations. Um, plus it, it meets this requirement for the operator to have to distribute that information to anyone that needs it. Uh, so it fulfills those, those two um, primary functions. Quick note about notification alerting. Apologize for the complexity of this slide it is a bit difficult. Uh, it's an important subject because we get a lot of questions about this. Um, the ladder is designed to have a notification function built into it, whereby a registered user can opt to be told if new information is being put into the repository. So if an operator signs up or an air traffic service unit signs up to the ladder, um, an aircraft is in distress, the operator can opt to receive notifications based on their three-letter designator, the uh, air traffic service unit can opt to receive notifications based on the geographical boundaries of their flight information region. Now, I will stress that this is an optional function. Um, it's, it's not core functionality for the ladder. The ladder is not designed to operate as an alerting system. It's designed to operate as a single point reference to, 
to accumulate and gather all that information about location of an aircraft in distress from multiple sources and make it available to anyone who needs it. That's its primary function. The notification is, is good um, and we think it will be useful and certainly there are options to look at in the future as to how it can be extended. But it is a notification of new data coming in. The primary means of, of, of generating alerts on aircraft remains the same as it has done before in terms of Annex 6 and Annex 11. So there's, uh, if there's doubt about the safety of the aircraft, then the operator can raise that to the ANSU. The ANSU can raise it and, and issue um, an alert phase declaration. Those remain the same. So we're not building the ladder initially as a means to alert all the people that, you know, all the various stakeholders that there is an issue that needs to be acted. Um, it's, it's entirely possible that it can fulfill that role. This is not a funda fundamental uh, requirement uh, of the ladder. It's designed as a store and access point for that information. So where are we on the timeline? Well, back in February 2019, we drafted some initial functional specs. Uh, there are actually two workshops in uh, 2019, one in April, one in July, looking at the functional and technical details, which helped us really to finalize those, those functional specs into something that we could then use to to go out on a uh, procurement process. That was done uh, in uh, late summer of 2019. A vendor was chosen and, and work started on developing a prototype. That prototype system, which is a functional prototype, was built up to the end of June 2020 this year. And then we ran a, a, a virtual tabletop exercise. It obviously was intended to be an in-person meeting, but that didn't happen. But a virtual exercise with around about 70 plus, I think, participants from from the four different stakeholders and operators, ANSUs, um, ADT service providers, and search and rescue. Um, and we, we used the prototype functional ladder system to generate uh, distress messages to send data into the system and to get those notifications sent out and, and have people respond and act to them um, as if they were responding to genuine events. And that again was very useful in terms of just uh, really consolidating how the ladder system is intended to work and getting some additional feedback from the participants about um, extra uh, little tweaks that we could make to the specifications and get that finalized. Just as a side note, the uh, functional specifications for the ladder are going to be published as, a, as an actual ICAO doc. So at the moment they're in sort of white, white paper format. They're available on the global flight tracking pages of the ICAO website. Uh, they will be published as a doc. It's going to be doc 10150. Uh, we, we pretty much finalized on that. We're just in the last stage of editorial for that before that goes out. And that, that will allow us to have a, a firm functional specification, which we can then refer to and we can update and, and do um, version control, et cetera. So having finalized the uh, functional specifications, we're then looking at moving into the final production build. Uh, the initial prototype for the ladder was built using um, an iterative design process. And when we start to move towards the final ladder, we're not starting from scratch. We're actually building on what we already have from the prototype to build it out into the final model. So we already have the, the basic foundation for the system, uh, which enables us to have reasonably good confidence that around about Q2, Q3 of 2021, we'll have the system up and running. Uh, we've already tested the functional prototype for connections with the ADT service providers. That's how we ran the workshop in August, in fact, is is that we injected data into it from, um, from an outside source, um, simulating the activation of an ADT on board the aircraft. So we know that the fundamentals are already in place. We just need to build out the rest of the functionality as defined in the functional spec. And of course, working towards the 1st of January, 2023 uh, applicability date for the forward equipage. Um, if we get the final system up and running by the end of next year, that gives us plenty of time to make sure that everything is in place and functional and tested prior to the first aircraft requiring to have that ADT um, device on board. Uh, functional prototype. Um, so it, it does do what it, the, the basic um, fun, functional requirements of the ladder are. So it, it accepts data from a contributor, it stores the data, it displays the data and allows um, it to be viewed and accessed. Now, obviously in terms of the full production system, it's quite limited. There's a number of different functions um, that really are quite key for the full, produ uh, full production model that, that we didn't put into the system, because really the prototype was intended to show the proof of concept and how it works. So we're aware that one of the key elements of this uh, data store is that certain 
stakeholders are going to want to get the data and import it into their own system. So when we look at the prototype slides and the following slides, we'll, we'll see what it looks like. What we're really looking at is, is the web-based viewer. And we're aware that for a lot of stakeholders, actually the web-based viewer is not really what they're interested in. What they want is the data. Um, so bear in mind that it is a functional prototype. It's not the full system, but it was designed to show how the system works. Um, so again, when we when we talk about ladder, this is generally what we we talk about, and this is the the web-based viewer screen of the location of an aircraft in distress repository. Now, the ladder itself really refers to the store rather than the viewer, uh, but just from a conceptual point of view, it's easier to to refer to it this way. Uh, this is uh, the ladder in what we hope will be its normal state. Uh, so this is showing the world with no just no aircraft in distress anywhere. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge to be designing a data storage system that we hope is not going to be used. Um, there are some issues to do with making sure it remains functional and that those connections remain in place when there is not likely to be a very regular testing of that system. So that's part of the functional specification that's required is, is uh, just verifying those systems are gonna be still operational when we need them. But this is what the, the ladder uh, home screen looks like. Um, as I say, basic functionality for the prototype. So it just shows uh, generic land versus ocean and then flight information region boundaries. There are a number of different layers that we would like to put on top of that uh, and that will be included in the full, um, full production system. Things like uh, airport locations, search and rescue regions, um, country boundaries, et cetera. There, there are various um, other elements that will go into place to, to add some more context onto these, onto these slides. In terms of the uh, optional, data, uh, optional elements that we, you know, what we've got in there at the moment, um, the notification system that was built into the prototype was purely based on email and that just for, for simplicity was just done so that we get the, product, the prototype system up and running and have it tested. So obviously there are a number of different options that are being explored for uh, notifications, principally AFTN. Uh, and indeed, one of the reasons for the selection of the, the suitable vendor for the development of the ladder was their experience of using the AFTN network. Um, in terms of notifications as well, right now it's a fairly straightforward yes, no, you either get them or you don't. Uh, a number of discussions that occurred over all three of the workshops we've had now have talked about how there's going to be a need to fine tune that, um, for example, to exclude aircraft if we know that there's a, there's a fault and there's an erroneous transmission of data. Um, so there will be further, further refinement of those notification systems. This menu page is up there now is, is just intended or was intended for the workshop just to show the, the level of optional you know, elements that, that will be included, the additional items. Um, and again, there's there's more detail in the functional specification on what, what those options are. In terms of the display right now, the the um, data itself is limited to lack long time, the three letter designated the operator, the uh, aircraft nationality and registration mark, the um, 24 bit address, the call sign and the flight number. Um, there are a number of uh, additional elements, both mandatory and optional that are intended to be built. And the idea would be that it, that among that whole list of all the mandatory optional data elements, if the ADT system provides it, the ladder will capture it. And the more information they provide, the more information can be used and will be of use to the uh, search and rescue um, community to identify the last known position of the aircraft. A good example of that is, is altitude and uh, ground speed and heading. So we don't make these mandatory, it doesn't require uh, the storage of those, and certainly Annex 6 doesn't refer to the need to capture those data elements. However, if, if the last known transmission from the aircraft also includes uh, the altitude and the direction it's moving and, and speed, um, then that, that's, that goes a long way into really refining that final uh, position of the aircraft and identifying the crash site. So those are optional elements. Again, it's all detailed in the functional specification. Um, and that will be uh, published officially as the ICA document very shortly. Uh, this is a standard notification. So this is what we were using during the workshop in August. Uh, every time new data was sent to the repository, this notification was sent out to the various stakeholders. Notifications along with uh, access to the data are tightly controlled by user criteria. So for example, if you register with the ladder as an operator, then your, your ability to view data and to receive notifications is limited by your three-letter designator. So you'll never see 
information about another operator's aircraft. Similarly, if you if you register as an air traffic service unit, then it's broadly speaking, it's it's limited to the uh, geographical boundaries of the flight information region. There's, there's a little bit more uh, complexity to the to the axes that I won't go into yet. But but essentially, as a user, you register, you have a profile. That profile determines what you can see, and it also determines what notifications you receive. Uh, so this is a typical notification that gives you just a short event summary, tells you what's happening. And then it provides that link to the uh, to the web viewer. Now, obviously, at the moment, the web viewer is is the method of accessing the data for the repository. Um, that information will be exportable. So part of the the key kind of functionality of the production system is the ability to export that data uh, to a third party system. So following that link, if you went into the system, you'd see something like this. Uh, this screen is actually showing you two events. So each one of those warning triangles is an event. So uh, the wide screen, the, the basic um, view that you come to when you open up the system just shows you the, the context and puts the, the uh, warning triangle in the right area so you know which one you're looking at. And then obviously when you select that, you will get a lot more information on the, the positions that have been reported. And by default, the information that's shown on the left-hand side there is the uh, last position information received, so last longitude and latitude, uh, transmitted time, and then of course the information that's necessary to positively identify the aircraft. Again, with the functional prototype, this is all defined. So we th this is all the information that we stored in the prototype just to get that proof of concept working. Um, it's not all the information that will be in the production system. And again, with that display, uh, and, and the options that are around it, there will be the ability to customize the display to show the, the information that you actually want to see as a user, uh, but also crucially to export that data and put it into a third party system. So that's how the uh, ladder system is looking now. Uh, that's the functional prototype. It is still uh, up and running and, and we're in the, the final stages right now of discussing um, the uh, release of funds to start working on the production system. So we're hoping that's going to be uh, going forward very soon. Uh, as I mentioned in my timeline slide, it's looking at Q2, Q3 for production system uh, development. That will be next year, which gives us, I think, a good year and a bit before we get into the, the actual uh, requirements to have the autonomous distress tracking device on the aircraft. Um, and that's it for me. That's, uh, that's the end of my slides. And so I'll... Uh, hand it back to Hank. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good to uh, see how this is also coming together. As was said at the uh, opening address, it's uh, it's uh, it's really great to see how um, uh, how how fast this development has uh, has taken place. Uh, it was necessary um, for for many reasons. Uh, we've seen uh, many uh, products uh, being developed in the previous. Uh, presentations and also this letter uh, sharing information, um, the uh, position information of the aircraft, but also point of contact information uh, that is very important in uh, responding to emergency situations. Uh, and besides that, also um, procedures and processes are very important. Uh, that uh, that really, it's not all about technology. It's uh, it's the complete set of solutions that. Uh, uh, the GETS is covering. Okay, so this was the end uh, of the set of presentations. If I can ask the panelists to switch on their cameras, then we can uh, see you all. Um, uh, Ian, somehow we are left with your smile uh, on the screen. Okay. <laughs> And your, your microphone is muted. So uh, there are a couple of questions um, on the Q&A. And uh, in the next minutes, uh, we will try to uh, answer as much as possible. I would like to ask the panelists to keep the answer as short and as focused as possible. Um, and I immediately start with a question for Emmanuel. Um, does the Ultima distress tracking have the ADT trigger built in in the unit, or does it require a separate ADT computer? So I think uh, Claude Pichavan answered this question actually. Uh, so uh, Claude from Airbus. So the ADT uh, trigger uh, is really part of uh, an aircraft computer. So I don't know if uh, Claude wants to elaborate on that. No, no, uh, thank you, Emmanuel. This is fully correct. So we have according to various, I will say, aircraft family, different uh, hosting computer. 
So we have, I will say, display computer for single A long range. And so we have a, a Sepium uh, on a 350, for example. Okay, thank you. That is, uh, that is clear. <laughs> Ian is falling from his chair. Um, the, um, the next question, one for Paul. Uh, which uh, satellite constellation is your solution uh, using? Uh, we currently use the Iridium satellite array, um, also linked to the next uh, satellite from generation of Iridium sets. Uh, so we, there's a low Earth orbit as opposed to geostationary, but we have the ability to use uh, both in terms of our configuration. It's uh, easily adjustable. Thank you, Paul. Um, and a question for Mercedes. A number of questions. Is it possible to hear something uh, somewhere, the example of an emergency signal so that we can use it in training? Um, second question is what kind of sensors uh, were used to uh, uh, establish abnormal flight profile during the test? And do you know roughly how much it is likely to cost a GA pilot? Oh, well, what's the price of your system? That's, the, that's I think, the, uh, the question. So if you can... Uh, Talk about these three questions, please. Yeah. So regarding the price, uh, yeah, he mentioned Grimas system, but Grimas uh, is the project. So we have several solutions there inside. Uh, I guess he's referring to the Beacon. Uh, the, the Beacon has a price that was produced by ECA Group. So they are the ones that have to, that can give him a, a, a price. But it was developed in order to adapt the price to the general aviation so that the cost the price was low, but to give a figure, I think it's better they, they contact ECA. For the rest of Grima solution, this is myself, so he can contact me, but uh, I guess he was asking for the for the beacon. So, and then okay. for the other yeah. question, sorry. Yeah, the other questions. So regarding the, the, the emergency signal uh, sound, uh, I, I put a link to a video in my presentation so the presentations will be available. He will be able to see the link. And there, there is the, 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 all the sound of the emergency received by the software. So here, there, he has an example. And then regarding the sensors of the beacon uh, that we use to detect uh, the abnormal behavior of the flight. So the beacon has some sensors uh, like the angular sensor, accelerometer, velocity, and temperature. And these are the sensors that were used to detect the abnormal flights during the tests. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you for the uh, uh, clear answers. Uh, Ian, there are questions for you. Um, the version of the letter specification, can you please uh, say a few words about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the version 3.1 that's on the Global Flight Tracking site was the, the version that was used to develop or initially tender for the, the ladder process. So that has been amended. As per the workshop in August, there was some feedback and some updates to the functional spec. Um, also, in, in discussions with the uh, Air Navigation Commission, one of our governing bodies, when we reviewed the um, proposals for additional provisions for PANS Ops Volume 3, the operator requirements to have a monitoring system, one of the, the areas that was discussed then was that the functional spec really should have you know, more formal status within ICAO. So we're in the process of converting that into a, to an actual ICAO document rather than it being uh, a functional specification, which is just, you know, published but not really uh, identified. So it, it's going through that process. It's been drafted. It's been finalised. It's been through editorial. It's just waiting on the final stages of approval. So really, it, at this stage, it, it should be out, you know, very soon. Um, but it's, you know, it can't be published until it's gone through the various approval stages. So hopefully very soon, and then it will be an official IKO okay doc, and then it will be a lot easier to find that. Okay, and then uh, another simple question, Ian. Um, uh, how and where will the operational ladder system uh, be implemented? How and where will it be implemented? So uh, there, there was another question on the Q&A that I think I, I typed an answer to. Essentially, so, so ICAO, essentially will retain the, the kind of high level ownership of the ladder system. So it will be for, for things like policy uh, and we have various processes in place to ensure that users are uh, correctly accredited, that will remain uh, within the IK remit. In terms of the day-to-day -day admin, so the actual hosting of the system and dealing with issues such as you know, maintenance and updates and, and passwords and user access, 
Um, that has yet to be decided, so the system will be developed. Uh, we are looking at various options for where and who will do that day-to-day -day admin and hosting role, uh, but that hasn't been formalized yet. Okay, thank you, um, Ian. Um, for Claude, um, what about retrofits on earlier aircraft? How long will it take and what costs and downtime uh, would that imply? The last two questions probably are difficult to answer, but... Uh, yeah, th th thank you. So th th the difficulty is that uh, we need first to certify the solution, okay? Uh, and when this, will, this one will be certified and uh, clearly defined, uh, we will propose an Airbus service bulletin in which, uh, according to the, uh, with the earlier aircraft definition, we'll be able to identify it will be, be the time necessary and associated cost. Uh, just for information, we have also... Um, Customer support uh, webinar, uh, which is available, uh, so uh, customer and client uh, can connect to it you know, and get information first time of information. But it's a little bit too soon to get such detailed information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I take an, uh, an, an uh, one, another one. Uh, maybe Paul, you can um, have a, a go at this one. Uh, question for the ELT community. How do they meet the independence of aircraft systems? I think you presented uh, that in your, your presentation uh, to meet uh, the GATS CONOPS. Paul? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I'm, I'm not too sure that the question should be directed at me, um, Hink, in terms of the ELT community and um, that, that meet the requirements of the GATS CONOPS in terms of um, power uh, communications and, uh, and, and um, navigation from an independence perspective. I'm not too sure, Emmanuel or, or Claude, maybe you guys could uh, jump in there. Yes, I, Emmanuel speaking, I can help a bit uh, on that. So the, the independence actually is provided uh, uh, by the internal GNSS receiver, which allows to acquire the the beacon location uh, independently from the from the avionics and also through the battery uh, which allows to power the, 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 the beacon even in case of uh, total loss of power in the aircraft. So that's the two main aspects of independence. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Mercedes, um, question for you. What happens when the cell phone goes out of reception range? Yeah. So I think maybe there was a misunderstood here because uh, the, the cell phone was uh, used to uh, remotely control the beacon. So it connects to the beacon through Bluetooth. Okay, to link the, the information on the cell phone of the pilot with the information of the beacon. But uh, that's also, it doesn't need uh, coverage. It, does only, it, doesn't need, it only needs Bluetooth. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian, um, there's a question. I didn't see the letter present any contact information for the aircraft operator. Uh, is it not meant to do that? So that's a good question. Um, we do have a contact information solution, which actually was implemented as part of the uh, aircraft tracking, normal aircraft tracking. So, so um, a couple of years back, we had the normal aircraft tracking implementation initiative, the NATI. Uh, one of the recommendations from the NATI final report was the establishment of a contact database for operator control centers and, and ATSU um, area control centers. And that's the ops control database. So I think if, if you're looking for contact information specifically for either operators and air traffic service units, then the ops control database would, would be the, the solution there. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian, for that. I just look at... Um the screen uh, has anybody designed the letter already for immediate use i think Ian, you responded to that uh, already what the plans are uh yes i mean it, technically the, the prototype would work as a ladder right now we, we it would be fairly limited in terms of what it does but it, but it is a functional system and it, and it would actually fulfill uh, many of the requirements um, but yes, the, the plan is to, to expand that and to, to fill out all of the functional specifications as per the, the functional spec doc. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking at the uh, list. I think we have talked about the questions that uh, we see. Is there anyone of you who would like to uh, 
from the panel who would like to react on uh, on any of the questions you see on the Q and A uh, session. No, I think uh, I think we have dealt with uh, most of them. If not, then uh, people can always uh, drop messages, uh, drop a, a question um, to uh, to the email. Um, I would like. Uh, we also um, well are are almost uh, at the hour, um, which is the end time of this uh, second uh, webinar. So I really would like to uh, thank Mercedes, Claude, uh, Paul, Emmanuel, and Ian. Uh, for their excellent presentations. Uh, it's really great to see that, um, um, well, being involved in the GETS CONOPS and all the work, uh, that uh, it really comes into to practice, into reality, uh, that's going to serve uh, the uh, aviation sector uh, at large, also general aviation. It's really uh, great to see uh, these developments. Uh, so with that, we're coming to the end of the second uh, webinar. Thank you all. Thanks for uh, attending uh, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I really hope to see you all also at the third and final webinar tomorrow, which will start uh, at two o'clock Central European time. And this webinar um, will bring it, uh, it all together as well. We will start uh, with some presentation from Kospar Sarsat. Um, we have heard already many references to Kospar Sarsat. Uh, Stephen Lett will uh, present uh, the Kospar Sarsat approach to, uh, to the GETS. And then we are going to um, uh, run through two use cases, uh, which uh, are using uh, real accidents that have happened. And um, uh, in these use cases, we will uh, demonstrate how the GETS would have reacted uh, in the various phases of the of the accident. So that's uh, also really interesting to see in practice how the the gets would uh, would be used. And we conclude uh, tomorrow with um, a presentation on accident investigation, and also the gets is serving uh, the accident investigators to get access to the flight data uh, as soon as possible after the accident to to learn from it and to prevent other accidents from happening. So that's for tomorrow. Again, two o'clock uh, Central European time. I hope to see you all. And for now, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you speakers and have a nice evening. Goodbye.